Hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, it's great to have people flooding into the, the comments here. All right, so welcome. And my name is Olivia. I'm a bookseller at Belmont Books. For those of you who don't know, Belmont Books is an independently owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts, and we've been bringing books to the community since 2017. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have a number of amazing virtual events coming up. Tomorrow night, January 28th, we are jo joined by Julie, C Julie Carrick Dalton in conversation with Andrew uh, Karvik to celebrate Julie's new book, Waiting for the Night Song. And on Tuesday, February 2nd, we are hosting Jeffrey Rediger in conversation with Chaya Bouvassanoir, excuse me, for the release of Jeffrey's new book, Cured. You can register for these and our other events on our website, belmontbooks.com, which is also where you can purchase tonight's book, Opening to Grief. We want to make this feel as much like a book event as possible, so please feel free to talk in the chat and ask questions. I'll relay them to Claire and Marnie at the, after the discussion. Also, just a quick note, when you are putting all of your awesome discussions and talking to each other in the chat, make sure that it's set to all panelists and attendees, otherwise only the panelists will see your questions and comments. Alrighty, and on that note, I am very excited to introduce Claire Willis and Marnie Crawford Samuelson. Claire is a clinical social worker working in the field of oncology and bereavement for more than 20 years. She's a former staff member of the Wellness Community, a national organization, and co-founder of the Boston nonprofit Facing Cancer Together. She man maintains a private practice in Brookline, Massachusetts. For the past five years, she's been a student at Koshin Paley Ellison, a founding teacher at the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. Marnie Crawford Samuelson is a documentary photographer, writer, and storyteller. Her photographs have appeared in national magazines and she is the principal photographer for two books, Lasting Words with Claire Willis and The Wild Braid with poets Stanley Kunitz and Janine Lenton. Marnie grew up in Belmont and graduated from Belmont High, class of 1965. She joins, uh, she lives in Wellfleet and Jamaica Plain. With that, I'll turn it over to our wonderful guest tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Olivia, someone just put in the chat that they can't hear anything. Oh, oh no. So I wanna, I wonder if other people could just chat and let us know they can hear us or somebody else could to make sure that we can be heard. Yes. Um, okay. It looks like other people okay. can hear. Okay. Um, people can hear. Okay. Rusty, I'd make want to make sure that your um, volume is all the way up on your computer. And uh, if any, oh, there we go. Excellent. Thank you. I'm so Thank glad you. everyone can enjoy this. All right. With that, I will finally duck out. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you all for coming. Welcome. Um, I'm Claire Willis, and I'm here with my co-author, Marnie Crawford Samuelson. Um, as Olivia mentioned, for two year, two decades, I've worked with people living with cancer and people who have suffered losses. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a yoga practitioner and teacher, and I'm a lay Buddhist chaplain. I lead support groups through Facing Cancer Together for cancer survivors and their caregivers, bereavement groups, therapeutic writing groups, and I have a small private practice in Brookline. So opening to grief was inspired by my work. Um, so often in my groups, I hear questions like, how can I get through this day? How long will my grief last? Am I doing it right? How can I survive the holidays this first year? So from sitting with questions like this, I became pretty obsessed with writing this book. And I asked Marnie to join me as a wordsmith because I'm not a writer. We've known each other for a mere six decades since summer camp on Cape Cod. And Marnie is a storyteller. She photographs, she produces audio and makes short documentary films. She is the writer of the book. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hi all. I'm very happy to be here. This is a homecoming of sorts for me. I'm a native of Belmont. I have spent lots of time in Belmont Center I think I know every inch of it. Uh, I have memories of coming to Filene's, which is where uh, Belmont Books is now in the old Filene's uh, footprint. Uh, I came there with my mother to buy my back to school clothes. And some of you may be old enough to remember that we also had our feet irradiated uh, downstairs uh, when we were getting our shoes fitted. 
Uh, Belmont's family doctor had an office uh, right across the street from Filene's and Belmont Books. And uh, after a childhood accident, uh, he helped save my life. Uh, we had field trips to the firehouse, now uh, Ilka Sally. Uh, we ate French fries after school from the fish market. And we hung out in Brigham's, which was right in the middle of Belmont Center. Uh, we'd like to begin our evening uh, trying something new. It's a brief, uh, what I call an audio montage, and you'll hear voices of people who know grief. This is the first time we've tried it. I hope that it will create um, an intimate space for sharing this evening. It was a tender experience for me to work with each of these uh, voices that you'll hear, people that you'll hear, uh, and to record their stories. And it's a reminder to me that the human voice offers such a clear and direct path to the heart. Um, it will take me just a moment to um, start the screen sharing. Uh, here it comes. I plunged into a dark period of my oh, life. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, I'm sorry. Let me In 2015, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. I was told my five-year survival rate was 20%. I plunged into a dark period of my life. When I had to fly back alone to Hong Kong for treatments, I assumed I was saying my last goodbye to my two young sons and husband. The cancer journey is hard, and unfortunately, I'm still on it. However, it has taught me to notice and appreciate every tiny little miracle around me. Clean air, fresh water, a shelter, a clean blanket, and the energy to talk or read. It may sound crazy, but all those things that used to matter to me don't seem important any longer. And all those little things I previously ignored have become my treasures. I continue to have pain and challenges in my life, but I have learned it, what to let go of, what to hold on to tightly, and most importantly, how to pause and be still. Daisy. I was approaching my fourth anniversary since I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I never thought I would live so long, and I had been planning ways to celebrate with my medical team. In less than four weeks, things went downhill. My cancer markers were up. I was hospitalized with pneumonia. Then the cancer progressed to my lung pleura and ribs, forcing another hospital stay. I was in pain, weak, and losing weight. And my mood barometer was on low. I was not sure I would recover. Cowering on the sofa, I faced a gloomy question. Should I stop treatments? and enjoy the few months left. Then spring came, sun and green buds. I learned to drain the fluid from my lung without pain. The new chemo showed promising results. Sitting on my front step at sunset, I watched golden light on the grape hyacinths. Inside my body, life was coming back. Brigitte. I keep a journal beside my bed. Some nights, instead of writing, I whisper my gratitude. I know that someone somewhere is listening. I'm grateful that the loss of my breast from cancer has unearthed my beating heart and made it visible to me. I'm grateful for the roof over my head I'm grateful I have enough money for tomorrow. Jackie. My unmailed letter to my husband who died. Dear Jim, what a glorious morning. Sunny and cold, nine degrees. Freshly fallen snow. I went cross country skiing on the rail trail. Beautiful and peaceful. The only company was a pair of deer that leapt across the trail in front of me. Breaking a trail on the new soft snow, feeling wonderful to be outside in the quiet where we walked together so often. And for once, I was dressed in just enough layers, half of which were yours, half mine. I felt myself smiling moving through the snow. I felt you with me. 
I hadn't taken skis out the last two winters. Last winter, not enough snow, and the winter before, too much snow, and my focus on being with you. I was happy to be skiing again, appreciating the stillness. With much love and gratitude, Debbie. As we began writing Opening to Grief, we didn't really have a shape or a voice or an idea about which direction we would go, but we knew what we did not want to do. We were sure we did not write, want to write a self-help book about grief because only you know what's right for you, what your grief feels like and what your unique path to healing is. So to give or, give or offer advice felt disrespectful. We're really grateful for the people who endorsed the book because so many of them wrote that the, oh, the book seemed like a companion. And we liked that, we, that, was a, that felt like a compliment. We wanted people to feel when they read the book that they were not alone and that others had walked this path through grief's time in confusing uh, and difficult terrain. In my practice, it's been really difficult for me to hear people struggle with shame and guilt that seems to lace through their, their, through their grief, often feeling like something's wrong with them. Maybe they have unrealistic expectations for who and how they should be, and they judge themselves for coming up short, often shaming themselves in the process. And often many of them have heard about the model of stages that have been overlaid in our culture, which were actually never intended to be for people who were grieving, but were intended for people who were dying. And they felt that they should be moving in some kind of linear way. I would often hear people say, I really lost it. I thought I was doing so well and I lost it. So unfortunately, when we feel shame, we often wall ourselves off, hold ourselves in, stay silent. We keep secrets and shame can fester in us in this damp soil and often creates even more suffering. In my groups, my bereavement groups, it's very common for me to hear people say, I haven't told this to anybody and I would only say it in here. So one member off, actually last night told us that she was sleeping with her husband's shirt because she missed his scent. Another woman unburdened a secret about after having lost her beloved 14 year old dog companion that she was sleeping with her dog's favorite toy. These months with COVID <clears throat> have been very devastating in ways that we're, in some ways we're beginning to glimpse and understand. While I wouldn't call it a silver lining, there it has been one positive aspect to it. And that is that grief has come out from under the covers. It's come out from the shadows and it now feels like a legitimate uh, conversation and subject in mainstream media. We can often see articles about it on, in the New York Times and the Atlantic, we hear radio shows about it on NPR and WBUR. And then what about last week, that miracle when we grieved together as a nation, when bells rang in Washington and in so many communities in this land, when 400 magnificent and holy lights, each representing a thousand lives lost to COVID, lined the Lincoln Memorial in Washington when now President Biden spoke these words, it's hard sometimes to remember, but that's how we heal. It's important to do that as a nation. I think many of us are sleeping better at night since the inauguration, at least in part because of the grief we've held inside us that has felt so overwhelming. And finally, it's coming into light. And for others of us for whom the election did not turn out as we hoped, we may be grieving the results of the election. In just months, we've become more comfortable and more fluent in the language and nuances of grief. We can recognize it, we know what to call it, and we feel a lot more permission to speak about it. It shows every, the, the deepening conversation shows every, every um, sign of continuing, as we, certainly as we continue to experience the pandemic pandemic, and we face other losses such as climate warming, and we begin to comprehend the potential dangers to losing our democracy as we confront new perils. We started to write this book four years ago, which now feels lifetimes ago. 
we couldn't have imagined the pandemic that was going to hit so forcefully last month, last March. Uh, we'd completed the book and suddenly received an email from the publisher uh, wanting to push up the schedule and get it out as quickly as possible. And so the quite uh, difficult question for us became how to write about grief in this time of enormous uncertainty, how to think about and describe the elephant filling the room, grief that isn't only our personal experiences, uh, but big grief that holds our collective experiences of loss and heartbreak. We began with an author's note that we knew needed to be at the front of the book. And we turned to a reflection by author and columnist, David Brooks, which uh, he wrote in April for the New York Times. Brooks had asked his readers to talk about their experiences in the first month or two of the pandemic to tell them how they were holding up. In just a few days, he received over 5,000 replies. He wrote, I think I expected a lot of cheerful coming together stories, but what I got shocked me. It was heartrending and gutting, frankly. People are crying a lot. It tends to be the young who feel helpless, hopeless, helpless and hopeless, who feel their plans for the future have suffered this devastating setback, a loss of purpose, a loss of hope. And then the old, the widows and the widowers talk about the precariousness of it, the loneliness of it. They just feel vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. There's this river of woe, river of grief out there that has really shocked me and humbled me. I love this image of a river because water has a tendency to seep everywhere. And this pandemic has seeped into every corner and aspect of our lives, for some of us more than others. So now in the US, we have 24 million infections and we have more than 410,000 people who have died. Credible predictions now speak of losing up to 500 or 600 Americans before COVID slows. How do we make sense of and hold on to the gravity of these numbers that represent real and precious people, entertainers, sports heroes, parents, siblings, neighbors, and children lost to COVID. I work with people with <clears throat> living with life-threatening illnesses and often hear some of them say, now other people know how we feel. How it feels to be frightened, to no longer be able to take for granted their daily routines or that they even have a future. Many of us too, both sick and well, hesitate to make plans because we don't know what's ahead. Of course, uncertainty and vulnerability have always been with us, but now we're confronting a big not knowing, not having a clue in ways that frankly stress us all. It seems that we're being called to cultivate a new relationship with big uncertainty, to develop resilience and grit to better meet whatever rises including great losses that perhaps we did not expect and we certainly did not want. And from this place of discomfort, maybe even to see how death and life, grief and love are actually radically intertwined. Jamie Anderson has written something really beautiful that while it's not in the book, I wanna share with you. Grief, I have learned, is really just love. It's all the love you want to give, but cannot. All that unspent love gathers up in the corners of your eyes, the lump in your throat, and in that hollow part of your chest. Grief is just love with no place to go. One of the elements we feel makes opening to grief a companion in a time of pain and suffering is the poetry. Our poems we've selected are open and accessible and they resonate with grief. And, and poetry tends to bypass cognition. It tends to go right to the heart. We begin each chapter with a reflection or a poem and we close each chapter with a simple meditation for a few starting and a few starting points for your own explorations. I'd like to start by reading the first poem and opening to grief called Naming by Carol Lynn Knight. Naming. If I name this grief, define it without guilt and redemption, 
Call it drowning. Call it desolation. Call it fire and stone. Then I am bound to care for it like a stray cat I name the demands I feed him. He comes and goes, sometimes disappears for days and then returns, insisting that I remember. We think of grief as kind of an umbrella word. It's a shorthand label that actually points to a whole range of experiences, emotions, physical symptoms, and behaviors that are all characterized as grief. Although many of us think of grief as sadness, sorrow, despair, loneliness, it also mentions other manifests in other ways that are less familiar and often contradictory, such as anxiety, fear, loneliness, irritability, impatience, anger, and even rage. Some people feel numb or they feel relief. Some feel gratitude for the lives they've shared for people who arrive to help. Maybe you have disrupted sleep or you're sleeping too much, or maybe you're over or under eating, or maybe you feel a deep fatigue some people react to grief by drinking a little earlier in the day, drinking a little more, overworking, underperforming, not exercising or exercising obsessively. Some people find that they can't focus or even read. Others, especially in the face of a traumatic death, may go through a period of the feeling that their faith has been shattered. Marnie and I decided to start the first chapter to name it starting with kindness. And part of the reason I wanted to do that was because there's so many models of grief that float around and against which people compare themselves. And so starting with kindness seemed really important. This is an excerpt from the first, the poem in the first chapter, and it's called Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. A loss, loss is shocking. It comes with an enormity that oftentimes we just can't take in. We may even be expecting a death, yet when it happens, we, we can't make sense of it. Our beloved partner or parent or child or pet was here just moments ago and now they're gone. We stand in rooms that are empty and silent. Amidst the pain and chaos that grief ushers in, it's kindness, isn't it, that feels like a reliable anchor, perhaps the only reliable anchor. Imagine if you had a close friend, uh, I'm sure we've all had this experience, who is grieving and struggling, and you simply remind them to be kind to themselves. This is good medicine for the soul. Could we treat ourselves in the same way we'd be with a close friend or a child we love who's hurting? This is from the book. In the weeks, months, and years after a profound loss, it's especially important to offer yourself great kindness. It's the best gift you can give yourself. As it turns out, it's the best gift you can give those you love and those who love you. How do you begin? Start wherever you are not in some idealized place where you think you should be, but exactly where you're standing. Perhaps you're someone who's who has restless energy, who likes to stay busy, who feels indispensable running from one obligation to the next, who habitually buttons up your emotions. Could you consider easing your schedule and giving yourself a precious gift of time, 10 minutes to sit and listen to a beautiful piece of music, an evening to be alone with your discomfort and grief, sometime in a warm bath. Maybe you harbor a harsh inner critic or a committee of judges and critics 
who shame you for crying too much or grieving too long or not grieving enough or not doing it right. Can you ask those voices to back off? Can you stop calling yourself a failure, a fraud, a rock or a wimp and offer yourself some empathy and compassion? Can you embrace your, vulnerabil your vulnerability, your irritability, your impatience and even your resistance as deeply human responses to separation and loss? Can you see how being open and tender with yourself allows you to better understand and connect with others, those who hurt and those who haven't yet experienced pain and hardship? If you look deeply and you sit with pain and suffering, can you feel how normal sorrow is, how it's a precious part of being human? Can you see how kindness, which includes being kind to yourself, seeing yourself as part of a larger community of people who all bear their own sorrows, is a path within and through grief to a life you might not yet be able to imagine. In her collection of essays called High Tide in Tucson, uh, Barbara King Solver writes this paragraph that I've kept with me since I first encountered it uh, some 20 years ago. In my own worst seasons, I've come back from the colorless world of despair by forcing myself to look hard for a long time at a single glorious thing, a flame of red geranium outside my bedroom window, and then another, my daughter in a yellow dress, and another, the perfect outline of a full dark sphere behind the crescent moon. Until I learned to be in love with my life again, like a stroke victim retra retraining new parts of the brain to grasp lost skills, I've taught myself joy over and over again. I came across this passage after a devastating cancer experience uh, when I was in my 50s. I'm a photographer and during the months of chemo and radiation, uh, miserable on the couch, it was miserable. I had put down my camera. I was no longer interested in taking pictures and I wasn't actually sure that I'd ever photograph again. At the time, it seemed to me that my body was busy simply trying to survive. Following in what I imagined as King Solver's footsteps, I decided to look for and photograph one beautiful thing every day. Sometimes I, some days I made a decent photograph. Many more days I simply searched and came home. But I believe this practice, which I uh, think of as a devotion really, renewed my life force. Someone else with different talents and passions might've painted or played music, danced or cooked a beautiful meal. In opening to grief, we write about the joys of making art, not so much as therapy, but as the deep satisfaction of making things. Marnie and I both loved writing the chapter called Restoring in Nature. It just feels universal. And there's a growing body of research that actually documents the benefits of being outside and spending time in the natural world. From our book, we live in a paradox. Humans have an instinct to bond and affiliate with other life forms. This is what renowned evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson writes about in Biophilia. We are drawn to nature like a moth is drawn to light. And yet elements of our fast moving culture undeniably have weakened our connection with the natural world. The immediacy and intensity of technology distract us. As adults, we tie ourselves to computers and mostly work indoors. When we experience loss, when we are grieving, it is more important than ever to find ways back to the proverbial or metaphorical garden to spend time in the power of nature. Researchers Rachel and Stephen Kaplan describe restorative environments as outdoor places that are accessible, quiet, and relatively small such as your yard or a pocket park in the city. And if there is no safe outdoor space where you live, if you are confined indoors, even in a hospital best bed, you can rest in nature, just looking out a window to a patch of sky or gazing at a plant indoors. I wanna close this section with one of my favorite poems that many of you might know called The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. 
When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound and fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. I'm just seeing a note in, in chat saying that our voices uh, need to be louder. So I'm, I'm gonna try to project uh, better. We all need other people, never more than when, than when we're overwhelmed by grief. We need each other for many things, to stay sane, to feel a sense of belonging, to take a break, to fix a leaking sink, to watch a movie together when we could do that, to talk about the unspeakable events that have happened, to sing and to cry. We need to check in. We need to be in the presence of others who can listen and remind us that everything changes and someday we'll feel a little bit better. This is from a, a chapter called uh, Joining Together. And probably in the pandemic, we should have called it, uh, we're all in this together. For many of us, it's family members who show up, some families more than others. It's neighbors, old friends, members of your religious community, your church, your mosque or synagogue. Sometimes it's strangers who come bearing life-affirming gifts. Yet when you're the person grieving and isolating, it's not always easy to reach out when you're overwhelmed with grief. So how can we balance the need and desire to take time out alone for solitude and to heal and also find ways to connect with other people? from the book. Sometimes we take a tentative step to reach out and then discover that friends who were attentive during the first few weeks after a death have returned to their own lives. What can a lifeline be then? Some people seek out a grief friend, a person at church or work, or a neighbor who understands that grief doesn't go away and who is willing to sit and listen as we cry, rage, laugh, tell and retell our story. Maybe you have joined a support group and heard someone say he talks with his departed partner and you say to yourself, I do that too. Or you hear someone say she can't bear to give her partner's clothes away because she believes, as author Joan Didion did, that her spouse may come back from the dead and need his shoes. And you laugh and think, me too. Perhaps week after week, you sit with the same people in your bereavement group, and one day you realize you are part of a beloved community. Doesn't it make sense that being part of a beloved community, we not only realize we're not alone, but that even in our sorrow, in our brokenness, we still have something to give, and we can still act generously. How will you take your broken open heart your vulnerability and tenderness and allow it to restore your own well-being. At some point when you're ready and only when you're ready and have enough energy to reach out, how will you allow your grieving heart to connect with others and make the world a little more friendly? The last chapter is welcoming the life that's yours. It begins with this personal reflection from Beth describing a moment about a year after the death of her beloved partner, Chris. It was a surprising sensation after that first searing year Chris was gone. I was staying at a friend's house in Provincetown and biking late at night down a winding hill at the west end of town. Rounding a corner where there's almost no light, there was the familiar exhilaration of speed and warm June air, nothing but wind sky and trees around me. And then a thought slipped in. Be careful, you wanna live. Live, wanting to live, what a concept. Was this a slight crack in the pain? I let the moment wash over me with the breeze and the moonlight. I was still miserable without her, my girlfriend, gone far too soon at age 46 of cancer. But flashes of light were starting to break up the unbearable darkness. 
Unfortunately, we don't get to choose what happens to us. Experiences arise and we often sometimes don't get what we like or many of you probably would not be here tonight with us. For most of us, there'll be no avoiding grief. Sometimes terrible things uh, do happen. And yet, even after a profound loss, perhaps you can imagine a moment when grief lifts just enough so that you sense something changing. You see that some old habits and behaviors no longer sustain you and will not support the well being of our children and the future generations. In this clear awareness, you recognize that now you have a chance to make different, more life affirming choices. You, need, you needn't succumb to, to despair. You catch a glimmer of something fresh. Perhaps it's a feeling akin to hope, a more sanguine or buoyant energy than you've known in a long time. Or maybe it's a whiff of persistence, of your own grit and resilience. You can keep going. You can cultivate an unshakable core. Even though you would not have chosen all the life you have, you feel some sense of purpose. You feel more balanced, more at home, stronger, more accepting of what's happened and the way your life is unfolding. How is this possible? When everything's uncertain, when you still suffer from unspeakable losses, how can there be light? And yet for many people there is. Some speak of grace or mercy. Others who don't believe in a higher power find solace in the human capacity to suffer and cry and also to laugh and even in the most tragic situations to glimpse joy. What if we got in touch with our vastness, our capacity like a lake or the sky to hold everything, to everything that arises? What if we allowed everything that's happened, accepted all the experiences we've had, accepting, not meaning that we like them, but we accept that they've happened. Those that we like and those that we don't choose. What if we were to pause and allow grief to wash over us and change us? as it inevitably does, and let ourselves open and be fully here in the only life that's ours to live. What have you learned from your suffering and pain? What do you have to share? How will you spend your precious life, this moment, these 24 hours? We close this section of the book with a poem by Alfred Huff Stickler called The Cure. We think we get over things. We don't get over things. Or say, we get over the measles, but not a broken heart. We need to make that distinction. The things that become part of our experience never become less of our experience. How can I say it? The way to get over a life is to die. Short of that, you move with it. Let the pain be the pain not in the hope that it will vanish, but in the faith that it will fit in. Find its place in the shape of things and be then not any less pain, but true to form because anything natural has an inherent shape and will flow towards it. And a life is as natural as a leaf. That's what we're looking for. Not the end of a thing, but the shape of it. Wisdom is seeing the shape of your life without obliterating, getting over a single instant of it. So before we invite you into the conversation, I want to just draw your attention to the back of the book. We, we read from the first section of the book. <clears throat> the second section is called um, Deepening Practices. And that this follows the chapters and, is, and also there's a section called Questions and Answers, or Questions People often ask with some answers. Throughout the book, we offer practices of mindfulness and meditation. And these practices, which go back at least to ancient times, are often described as simple. And they are, but that doesn't mean they're easy, especially for those of us that have grown up in a Western culture. In deepening practices, we encourage you to embrace a beginner's mind, to try out one of the practices, be gentle on yourself as you find your footing and see what they may have to offer you in helping you hold and be with your grief. 
So now we'll open up to questions and also any resources people would like to share with one another that's been useful to them in their grieving. Um, so please feel free to put a question in the chat. Thank you guys so much for your readings. They're really lovely. I honestly wasn't expecting to be so moved by the pieces that you shared. I, you know, quarantine has been a lot for everybody. So it's really nice to actually find unexpected inspiration from so many places. Um, so beginning with questions, um, I actually had a question for you guys. This work seems so difficult that you guys have devoted your lives to. Um, and mostly for Claire, I was wondering what initially drew you to this work, considering it can be so, take such a heavy toll when you're giving so much of yourself this way. Well, you know, it, it's so interesting that you asked this question. Um, I think my whole life I've been told I'm so intense. And in my family, I was always accused of being a probe, asking questions that were too probing. <laughs> and I found people that welcome those questions in doing this work. But I think another factor in doing this work was watching when my mother died, how, how much realer our conversations became. And also I had a life-threatening experience um, about 12 years ago. And I realized how uh, life and death are so in intricately related that my coming up close to death made me just created such joy in my life and gratitude for being alive. And I wanted to try and bring that sensibility into my work. That, that, that's amazing. Um, it's always wonderful to me to learn why people were motivated to do the things that ultimately shape their lives. Um, I think also the, the other thing I just add, it's funny, I was writing about this today for, so it's on my mind. I think growing up in my family, grief was, we didn't talk about grief and my parents carried a lot of invisible sorrow that was never spoken, a lot of tragedy that I only learned about long after they were gone. And I think grief was the wallpaper in our house mm -hmm. and I could feel it, but I didn't know what was happening. And there was a lack of vitality in my family for, for I think the reason that they, there was so much unexpressed grief. And so I think that normalizing grief in, in any way I can has become somewhat of a, an obsession really, because there's so much, there's so much grief everywhere, especially now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, so we do have another uh, lovely question. Um, one of our attendees, from one of our attendees, um, I'm a recent cancer survivor. The same activities and psychological strategies that I use to get through cancer are the same things that I'm doing to get through the uncertainty of COVID-19. Who would believe? Who would have believed that being a cancer survivor would it be getting me through a pandemic? And mm -hmm. they would love for you to discuss resiliency. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, Marnie, do you want to say well, something I mean, about the, that? Well, I mean, the first thing that, that came to my mind uh, in, in the cancer, my own cancer experience was the notion that um, I had to, I had to work and I had to be uh, with what was. I, rather than hoping that I'd have the best results, I had to learn to work from whatever, whatever the results were, go were going to be. And, and so I really was introduced to Buddhism at, at that point. And I think, you know, the pandemic has that quality too of, you know, enormous, profound uncertainty and the grit or the resilience is in meeting whatever is whatever is coming mm -hmm. and that is not an that is not an easy thing um and so perhaps that's what the the person who uh wrote in the chat is talking about that the cancer experience does does forever change you transforms you and this pandemic experience is transforming all of us i mean you could feel it in the uh, ceremony at uh, the, the the pool in uh, in Washington that four hundred thousand lives 
has affected all of us and it's affected everything in our everything in our day. So I want to say something about resilience um, to uh, actually to this person who is finding that their, their strategies for getting through cancer helped her get through um, or getting or helping her get through COVID. So I, I think one of the things, and, and we have a chapter about this is, and, and I know this always sounds a little trivial, but it's so uh, substantially uh, based in research. And that is having a gratitude practice that our minds are, are hardwired to be habituated towards what's negative. And that's not a bad thing because in ancient times it helped us survive, but it's actually something that we don't need anymore. And so what happens is that we don't notice what's right in direct proportion to what's wrong. So having a gratitude practice doesn't mean not noticing what's wrong because it's very important to be with sorrow, to be with the cancer experience, to be with the losses of COVID, but it's also noticing what's right alongside. So if you think about a typical morning in your house, you get up, you use the toilet, you maybe make a cup of coffee, you make breakfast and you go wherever you're going. And if all those things work, you don't think anything of it. But if you get up and the toilet plugs and the coffee maker overflows or you have a fender bender where you're going, you might say, I've had a terrible morning. And so we don't notice when things are going right. So part of really building resilience is beginning to notice and linger with what's right for 10 to 30 seconds because you can begin to rewire your brain. And one of the reasons to have a gratitude practice is that it strengthens resilience and it strengthens your capacity to hold your suffering and your grief. So it's not a, 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 a trivial thing. The, at the University of North Carolina Medical School, they have the doctors keeping gratitude journals and they've found there are fewer medical errors, they sleep better at night, and the doctors have more pro-social behaviors between them. So just writing down three things at night before you go to bed will start making that commitment. You will start to redirect your attention during the day to noticing things that are right. And that will help you hold the grief of cancer, of COVID, and whatever other losses you're having in your life. That's really wonderful. I mean, just as somebody who is absorbing your really beautiful words, the two of you have such a wonderful use of language and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. But um, it's always nice to have like a thing you can do. It's easy to say, you know, think positive and focus on the things that you care about. But like having a thing to do, I think is always very powerful. Um, we had another question. Um, Edith mostly just, it looks like wanted to share um, that she lost her husband of 11 years. Um, this, this is her um, mm -hmm. statement here, but I am grieving our relationship, but also the suffering he endured for the two years of his cancer. I'm also grieving the sorrows that he endured during his early life. And I think she mostly just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's why you guys are here to mm -hmm. bring those things. It's, to it's really tough to watch someone you love suffer. I, I, I just want to say that that's a really hard way to watch someone go that you've loved and spent your life with. And I would just say, I'm really sorry. Um, I hope you can find a community of people who have been through a similar experience that might help you feel less alone in your loneliness and in your grief. Certainly, um, I, I'm just going to say that the organization that I co-founded called Facing Cancer Together offers free bereavement groups for people in your position. So uh, this isn't a money profit making promotion, but just a resource that is on Zoom right now that you may wanna um, get in touch with to help you walk through your grief. You know, and one of the things it brings up for me is, you know, the first thing you wanna say to somebody, uh, hearing what Edith's saying is, I am so sorry for your loss. I, I bet you've heard that you know, from many, many people. And it feels so inadequate in a way. It's like, thank you for your service. I'm so sorry for your loss. It doesn't seem like enough to say, I'm so sorry for your heartbreak. You know, I'm so sorry for what you've been through. I don't know if other people feel that way, but to me, it, I feel like we need more, more language to connect 
when you know that what somebody's been through is, you know, the worst experience of their lives. I mean, it's just, you know, unspeakable suffering. From a similar note uh, that you were talking about, Claire, um, Jessica is looking for a bereavement group to join and she wonders if you have any resources for finding the right one. Um, I don't, I, it's hard to say, Jessica, because I don't know the nature of your loss. I don't know, but I, I can say if the person you lost uh, died of cancer, we have a bereavement group at Facing Cancer together. Otherwise, I would contact any number of local hospices because most of them offer bereavement groups and um, they're free. And they usually have people in them who have uh, lost people to a variety of circumstances. So I hope that's helpful. There's Good Shepherd. Um, there's a center for um, bereavement up in Danvers. It actually doesn't matter where we live now because we just tune in. Um, but most of the hospices in the area have bereavement groups. So I, I would send you there. I'm, I'm just seeing uh, Joan O'Connor's uh, note in chat. Uh, Joan is a dear classmate of mine, and um, I, I know what she's I know what she's going through, um, and I know that experience of waking up every day, and the first thing that comes into your mind is you know dread or despair. I, I for I I can't tell you how many years, but I would wake up and the first thing was yikes. It was like yikes, and I. You know, I don't say that anymore, but I did for a really long time. I mean, it spoke to something, you know, really, really deep. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't have a lot to say, except that at the end, Joan says, everything seems so empty now, yet I feel, this is the, this is the tell, yet I feel as though I should be able to move forward. I think that's where the extra suffering comes in because you're probably right where you need to be. Right. Can you speak to that, Claire? I would say exactly that. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, it's hard. These questions are hard to answer on in chats because there's no back and forth. But I don't know what you mean when you say I'm not resilient. If you're getting up every day and you're doing your day, regardless of how you feel, you're resilient. You, you know, you're walking through life. It sounds like you're living in a, situ with a situation of anticipatory grief. I mean, some real grief, but also some anticipatory grief, not knowing what the, the progression of your husband's, um, uh, I guess, dying is gonna look like. And I, that's a very hard grief to live with. Um, very hard and I just would urge you to be really gentle and kind to yourself that you might be more resilient than you think. And I, I know that Joan is resilient and you know I know you are. I know that you go and you visit and you show up and you stay connected and you cry and you walk and I, I know that you are you know just be careful of your expectations on yourself. That's what I would say. All right, well, if um, anyone has any more questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We do have a couple of more minutes, but I wanted to thank the two of you again for coming and you know, giving us the space to talk about these really crucial and important things. I mean, I know that personally, so much of the advice I've gotten over the past year has been be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very under, you know, it's an underutilized tool. It's just kindness, not only to other people, because sometimes that's easier to give than to yeah. yourself. Um, so it's wonderful to just hear it again, that kindness to yourself is a resilient act. Um, yeah. It looks like that we have um, finished up. Thank you all so much for coming. I know it means the world to Belmont Books and also to our lovely uh, guests tonight. You can get your copy of Opening to Grief where you can find Marnie and Claire's beautiful words at Belmont Books. Um, I put a link in the chat earlier, but it's also just the same place where you signed up for the event tonight. So I, I just wanna add one thing. 
please buy locally from your local bookstore and review on Amazon. Yes, if you have a Goodreads account, that's also wonderful. Lots of people read on Goodreads and we definitely want to boost the wonderful words that uh, Claire and Marnie have shared. And we do very much appreciate um, your business at Belmont Books. It's wonderful to get support from the community. I, I will say that the bookstore is a wonderful place. Oh yes, um, fabulous. Yeah, it has made all the, it has made all the difference. Well, that means the world to us. Um, all right, thank you all so much for coming. There's a question that I think is important that I'm just reading. Um, going back to uh, what Marnie, this is going back to what you spoke on about, I'm sorry if you're lost, what do you say that is genuine? I used to say it myself until I lost my father and then recognized how hollow. Do you have a response to that? I, I do, if you don't. Please, please, please do. Um, the first thing I say often is, how can I support you? What do mm. you need? And, and then I'll say, can I get you gross? And sometimes mm. when people are deep in grief, they can't even come up with the chores. And so saying, can I take the children to school? Can I pick them up? Can I go grocery shopping? Can I go to the cleaners? Can I come by and bring a meal? Just telling them what you're able to do with concrete tasks. But how can I be of support to you, I think is the, mm. the best thing to say. That's so true. You know, uh, one of the most uh, poignant um, conversations with my father was when I called to tell him I had cancer. And of course, I burst into tears as, any, as anybody would. And my father said, I'm so sorry. How can I help? Yeah. You know, that was like his really fine moment. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So thank you. We're, we're so, so glad you invited us. Yes, well, we're, we were so glad to have you guys. And uh, hopefully we will all get to be together again soon. We'll be drinking coffee in the Bear yes. Cafe. Yes, Black Bear Cafe. Black Bear. will be a wonderful place for us all to uh, gather together and appreciate beautiful words and poetry. All right, thank, thank you. you all so much for coming. Um, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Stay Thank safe you. out there and have a great rest of your night. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.